People's baseline is, is dollars and they've seen their prices go up crazy amounts in dollar terms. It makes them question things and it creates a lack of trust in U.S. institutions and people look for something different. And I think this high level macro theme is why more and more people and businesses are, are saving in Bitcoin. I, I recently saw a speech of you, I think like three, four weeks ago at the MicroStrategy days where you talked about like Bitcoin future trends, Bitcoin future adoption trends, I think uh, was the topic called. And I thought it would be interesting to uh, talk with you about adoption of Bitcoin, how it was in the past, how it is going in the future, uh, and especially what you are also seeing with River, because you have a unique perspective with River and seeing like institutional adoption, but also like uh, a peer uh, adoption. Um, but before we start into that, how did you like adopt Bitcoin? How did you get uh, find your way in, in Bitcoin? My backstory goes all the way back to when I was an undergrad in college. I got really interested in economics and ended up reading some of the classics that I think a lot of people in this space have, have read at this point. I, I, re I remember distinctly reading The Denationalization of Money by Friedrich Hayek and getting really obsessed with this concept of alternate money, questioning what is money, questioning central banking. And that sent me down the rabbit hole of wanting to create my own currency that in fact, by commodities, I couldn't really figure out how to do that or make a business of it, given all the regulations and a non-obvious go-to-market strategy. And then I came across Bitcoin and realized it solved the problem in a much smarter way and have been obsessed ever since. So that's my origin story. And then I ended up moving to the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area in 2013 to pursue a career in Bitcoin and have been largely doing that ever since. Mm. Very cool, very cool. Uh, and let's now talk a little bit about the topic. Uh, it, will be, it will be interesting how to see your, your perspective on that. Um, for me, it's really interesting uh, that Bitcoin grew from that small idea, like that idea that like was in one man's head or like maybe a few more people involved in that. And it grew from this experimental thing all of a sudden to like a big asset where big companies, uh, big even countries are investing in it and adopting it. Um, how, so first of all, like, why do you think was Bitcoin successful? What, what, what do you think is like, the, if, if it's one reason, like what could it be? Like, was it the anonymity of Satoshi Nakamoto? Was it like the, the, the um, a, a difficult adjustment? Is there like one thing that you would point to, like that was the major thing, why it is successful? I think the major trait of Bitcoin that made it successful was the scarcity uh, and, and uh, the dynamics of the, dif of the difficulty adjustment and, uh, and issuance schedule. I think that was key to its success. Also being first, of course, was very important. And those were the two big things. This, this, this digital scarcity uh, really drove the value, which drove the attention. Mm, really cool. Oh, and and how did you uh, and and how satisfied are you actually? I, I, when when I look at Bitcoin, like when I got, came into Bitcoin, I was like, it's really cool, but I kind of expected that it grew faster. Whenever whenever you come in, like oh, it's so obvious, uh, but then like you you can uh, like people need time for it to wrap the hand around, like it, the things need time. But how satisfied are you till now with, with the adoption and how it's going with Bitcoin? Well. I'm, I think it could always be better. I think that we could have always been smarter at building faster and building uh, more user-friendly products earlier. So Bitcoin could probably be further than it is today if we had had more and higher quality builders in the space through its life. That said, it has really come a long way. And um, I don't really think it's that useful to think about, oh, what could have been, what could have been. But What's really important is that we're honest about what are the biggest opportunities, what are the biggest challenges people face today, and how do we solve those? And how do we attract smart, talented builders to, to solve those things? Right now, and, and sort of today, Bitcoin has really seen success largely because, like I said, of the scarcity, and it, it really has the product market fit for being a great store of value and long-term uh, long investment for millions and millions of people. That's really what's attracting people in the West, at least, to Bitcoin. I think that because the US dollar is so strong, 
uh, globally, relatively. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of inflation with the dollar itself, but relative to other currencies, it's quite strong. That that hasn't created as much of a compelling need for this alternative, this alternate um, savings tool and medium of exchange globally. So, uh, I think that's the biggest macro trend that impacts Bitcoin at the moment, and we'll see how that plays out. So you're saying that because the Western civilization with like America and Europe, the currency is not as bad as it could be. Uh, people see it as a luxury item and don't uh, spend too much time. Like the, the pain is not big enough, basically, right? Right. And for those who are in pain uh, in, in, in countries with really bad currencies, of which there are many, They would they just use dollars. They want dollars. Um, they're not using Bitcoin to solve their problems because the dollar still has such a big network effect and such a huge brand uh, that and and it's and it's a much stabler uh, currency as well. So uh, what we're seeing is you know Bitcoin is really actually Bitcoin has private market fit for people who are or for wealthier people who are long term saving. Uh, it does not have product market fit for the average person. Uh, who has a crappy currency in their country. Uh, uh, stable coins and, and dollars have a much better product market fit objectively in those markets today. Um, maybe some are not familiar with the term product market fit. What, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, good point. Product market fit is a concept that, determine, that, that defines whether or not a product uh, is accepted by the market, is is the market the market embraces it and uh and really wants that thing so uh, an example of something with uh, excellent product market fit is instagram uh or facebook um an example of something with bad product market fit would be um you know selling water to fish right that's like the sort of ultimate example of a bad product to sell right so uh those are the sort of the two ends of the spectrum What I'm curious about when you see big corporation like Apple, they're having so much cash on their balance sheet uh, and they're having a lot of great and intelligent people working on them and they are thinking probably like daily, what can they do with capital? What can they do uh, better in, in doing that? Bitcoin had to come up at some <laughs> in some meeting probably. They had to discuss it in, in some capacity. I, I think, uh, but uh, maybe I'm ro uh, wrong here. Um, wh why are the really huge corporations, I mean, there are some examples with Tesla, with MicroStrategy is also kind of huge uh, and other companies, but not not too many of them. And when you look at the S&P 500, it's only Tesla and maybe uh, soon uh, MicroStrategy. Why they are not, uh, what do you think is the, the, the reason why they are not doing it? Is there some legal reason or is it just they are not, <laughs> the pain not big enough? I don't think it's legal. Uh, I think at this point, it's just cultural. It's under lack of understanding. Um, uh, I think that it really just gets down to sort of they don't believe that it aligns with their mandate. Uh, you know, they might they might just. It's hard to say how, you know, a firm like Apple or they have sort of this kind of hedge fund thing that manages a lot of their capital. I forget the name of it. Um, uh, it's hard to know sort of like how. How, how they think uh maybe they view it like gold and they go well we wouldn't buy gold either because gold is just like this metal and so i i don't know what's going through their heads i don't know why they, they don't um but there is a lot of inertia at these firms of how we do things how we what is our framework for investing a lot of treasury management also isn't about what's the how can we make get the most alpha how can we grow the value the fastest uh, a lot of it is you know rule number one is don't lose the principal value of of the cash of the treasury we're treasury management we're not we're not actually running an investment fund and so um that's also potentially sort of a, a headwind to any anyone managing a corporate treasury if you don't actually believe in the long-term value of bitcoin you have deep conviction of that um you know, you wouldn't buy it in a treasury because that would run counter to sort of the gospel of treasury management, which is first, don't lose the money. Uh, I, I guess uh, River has in incorporated in somehow a, a Bitcoin strategy. 
Oh, definitely. Over half of our treasury is in Bitcoin, mm -hmm. uh, which is very rational for us because we believe in it long term and the success of our business uh, depends on the success of Bitcoin. So it's sort of a no brainer. Um, but uh, but not every company is like that. And really what we see is the companies that uh, bought that put Bitcoin in their treasury are companies that are run by people. I call it an orange pill dictator. Uh, they are run by an individual typically who believes in Bitcoin and can make the unilateral decision to put some of the treasury in Bitcoin. A company like Apple uh, is not does not pattern match to that. One, Tim Cook isn't necessarily a big Bitcoin believer, but even if he was, um, he might not be a big enough believer to push at the board level and at the corp do the corporate politics necessary to do that. He might not want to waste his political capital in that because Tim Cook isn't Steve Jobs. Tim Cook isn't. Um, you know, doesn't have full control of Apple, right? Uh, whereas Tesla, Elon is a dictator and he can say, we're buying Bitcoin, right? So, um, uh, you know, MicroStrategy, Michael Saylor runs MicroStrategy and he be believes in this deeply. So even the big public companies, they pattern match to this dynamic. Um, that's why you don't, you haven't seen the Walmarts of the world buying Bitcoin. It's, it's, it's fascinating for me uh, to see in uh, bad also. It, it reminds me also of how early we are. When we, when we see the S and P five hundred and all those big co uh, companies um, that we are seeing, and it's like we are, we're not even close to any sort of major adoption. Um, but one uh, big step was, uh, I mean, the first big step for me in traditional uh, adoption was MicroStrategy in twenty twenty. Uh, then, yeah, when we count El Salvador also in there, uh, we could also count that as a big step. But a really huge step was also taken this year. Uh, how do you look? at the Bitcoin ETF? I think the Bitcoin ETF was a big driver for the institutional, I guess the right word is acceptance of, of Bitcoin as an asset class. Institutions by definition, or not by definition, but generally, unless they're run by a dictator, they're typically run by, they're typically run by people who are good at getting ahead in an organization. And those types of people are not the, uh, they're not the people who think different who are willing to take big risks, who are willing to say, who, who are willing to say, I'm going to do something I deeply believe in, even if it risks like my career. And so what that means is for most institutions to adopt Bitcoin, it has to be something where the person, where we're proposing Bitcoin as an investment idea. When, when you do that, you can say, hey, look, other smart people say this is okay now, mm -hmm. right? BlackRock says Bitcoin is okay. I'm not saying Bitcoin is okay. BlackRock says Bitcoin is okay. So if this doesn't go well, my career now isn't at risk because because it was BlackRock that said that Bitcoin was okay. So um, you know, you 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 like most people are like that, right? Most people in the world are not um, disagreeable types who will take big risks in life. And so, and most companies are run by people like you know who who are much more conservative. And so. Now, all of a sudden, all the sort of conservative actors and these big, slow moving institutions have uh, have have cover uh, if, if they if they go ahead and move forward with a Bitcoin strategy. It's it's, it's fascinating to see for me uh, where the Bitcoin ETF is probably also the reason why we did for the first time ever the all time high before the halving, uh, which we never did before. Probably it's the, the, the ETF. So it would be interesting to see. River has also saw. I can remember one chart that River put out, like a decision maker chart, where you end up on the left. Uh, you only buy Bitcoin ETF if you are legally forced to buy a uh, Bitcoin ETF. Uh, other ways, it just does not make sense to actually buy a uh, uh, Bitcoin ETF, uh, which really, it, it's, it kind of brings me to that, that question where, like, when we have the fiat currencies now and we have the fiat system now, and we have this Bitcoin technology companies like river but also bitcoin etf in some sources like this bridge technology from the fiat world onboarding to this new um uh, bitcoin way do, do you all see it uh, like that do you see to see that we are in, in at some point in a, in a fully bitcoin world no matter it's like maybe it's like in 20 years maybe it's 200 years it's really hard to predict the, the timing of that but do you see the end goal that the whole world is using bitcoin as a global reserve asset currency i think we'll keep moving closer to that uh i think it's hard really hard to predict exactly what it looks like um 
because it's such a complex system. If the dollar stops being the reserve currency of the world, then that means the world order has changed a lot itself, right? Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know what that means. How, like, what's the new steady state? If it's not American hegemony, what does that look like? And what is the impact there of how nation states choose currencies and you know what they use? So I think it gets closer to that. I don't know if it ever gets exactly 100% there. I think there will always be nation states that want their own money. And uh, I think it'd be sort of delusional to think otherwise. Maybe competitive forces sort of force most any kind of first class country to have hard money backed by something like Bitcoin. I want to think that's that would be the case, but it's really hard to know. It really is. I also think that uh, a full Bitcoin standard is kind of wishful thinking at, uh, at this point. Uh, it, it, it is not uh, impossible, but it's really hard to imagine when we see uh, what power uh, an own national currency gives to the government, and they don't want to give up that. Uh, and they can also they, they can always have this like we you you have to pay our taxes in that system, you have to pay that and that in our system. Like it, it's hard for me to, to imagine that. Uh, a different question. You are the CEO and the CTO of River, right? Yes. Which is interesting because uh, I love, by the way, tech-led companies uh, that are led by someone who is, is technical. So, so you probably started River and also developed the app? Yeah, I wrote the first code for River. Um, but pretty early on, we hired some great engineers who moved things much faster because even, even just starting out, a company, there was a lot of work that wasn't coding, right? Um, just getting all of the company infrastructure up and running, legal stuff, fundraising. So m a lot of my time was already t spoken for. And so, but I was, I always wanted to keep control over the large technical decisions because I had very strong opinions and um, wanted to make sure that we didn't make certain mistakes that I've seen made elsewhere. And, um, and so uh, it's worked well so far, I think, especially with the, it, I think that CEO and CTO sort of joint roles will probably become more popular, if I had to guess, as technology continues to progress. Um, I think that more and more companies will be moving towards the pattern of hiring as few people as possible who are very high caliber and utilizing technology as much as possible to improve the productivity per person. And so... Um, that's how I've always viewed business, especially in the technology industry. It's how well can you execute, how well, how correct can you be about a strategy and a vision? And then when it comes to executing on that, um, how few people can you do it with and how much can you utilize computers uh, to, to, to do that um, quickly and effectively? And so um, I think being, you know, engineer led is, is a huge competitive advantage there. Absolutely. I see that a little bit with the podcast even because I do every day a podcast episode and I do like a trailer before I have to editing stuff like that. There's a lot of things that would not have been possible like even five, 10 years ago because AI is doing so much of the transcripting, so much of the summaries, so much of the other things. Uh, and probably like the same thing that I'm doing right now in 10 years ago, I would need probably at least one employee for that. And now I have AI helping me. I still have to do a lot of <laughs> a lot of things with text and a lot of writing, a lot of uh, how to put something in context, how to uh, put something out there so people actually want to watch it. But still, like AI is helping me a lot. It's like an employee. It's like my best employee who's it's not a lot. He's not expensive, but he uh, does his job every time. <laughs> Predictable. Totally. Um, totally. What, what, what would you say is like the most important uh, when you think of developing an app like River, like uh, in, in, in the technical sense? The number one most important thing is security. Um, it's, it's not messing up. It's, so security and correctness, which are in many ways all roll up to the same goal of keeping our clients' funds safe. Mm -hmm. um, our clients' funds and information. Uh, so that that is... Th Number one in our organization, we never compromise on those things. Uh, th those are just hard lines that um, you know we just can't get wrong. And so, if a project gets if a project gets delayed because we're not super confident in you know the security or correctness of it, then that's just what happens. Um, those are just non negotiables. Uh, that's not always the case in every business, right? Um, and, but in this industry, it has to be. Uh, 
you know, at, at an Instagram or Facebook, that's maybe not as important, right? You're not dealing with people's money. Um, you can bias a little bit more towards just moving fast and every now and then having a little bit of an issue. Um, so that that's number one. Um, and then an, another another one that is a big input into that is simplicity. So the 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 easiest systems to keep correct and secure are the simplest systems. And so uh, a, a big a big thing that I obsess about at the entire company is simplicity and keeping keeping things as simple as possible, keeping systems as simple as possible, deleting parts instead of adding more, uh, and and um, that is really what pays dividends long term. Is this something that you would uh, change in, in 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 the Bitcoin code, or is it uh, perfect as it is? Bitcoin Core. Bitcoin Core, yeah, the the base. Oh, it's very far from perfect, but there's also the reality of just systems, right? Just because, um, like we have stuff at River that I wish we could change, but once you have something up and running, it's um you now have a cost to change it, right? And so uh, if I could do everything from scratch again, would I do would I do things differently? Yeah, there's definitely some things I would do differently in the code. And same with Bitcoin Core, and I think any core developer would agree there's things that they would definitely do differently. But once something is up and running, it's a very different story. And so I think that's, I think the Bitcoin Core team has done a great job uh, sort of iteratively moving towards simplicity um, and, sec- and, and adding more security over time. For example, uh, when Satoshi wrote Bitcoin Core, it used a library for cryptography called OpenSSL. It was this big library, this big third-party dependency. It had a bunch of stuff we didn't need, and it even had some bugs and weird quirks and stuff. It took a few years, but eventually they were able to just delete that and cr- have a much more streamlined cryptographic, uh, you know, library and, and code in there. But um, it had to be done iteratively because you had all these nodes running all over the world. You can't just hard break everything and, and stop things from working and, and and do it all differently. So once the plane is flying, if there's something you want to change, you got to do it without crashing the plane. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing, how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be sp- stored on a hardware wallet, on a self-custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners and there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. So it's, it's, it's a big hard, hard thing, I, I imagine. Um, but a lot of things probably can be fixed or improved uh, anyways, not on the base layer because there's always compromises to make uh, between security, scalability, and, and, and all, those, all those things. How do you see then layer two technology? There are a lot of different technologies like Fediment, Lightning. I heard so, so many different <laughs> technologies already. I'm kind of always really bullish on the, on the base layer. And I'm trusting in the Bitcoin community that second layers or even third layers will be built in a really great way where we enhance maybe privacy, uh, fast speed and stuff like that. Um, do, do you see any advance, uh, advancement that you're really excited about? Are, are you excited about the Lightning Network? 
Oh, I'm very excited about Lightning. I think, um, but you know, at the end of the day, I think that there's a culture in, in Bitcoin and in crypto in general of focusing on tech in a way that misses the forest for the trees. Um, and what I mean by that is the number one most important thing uh, when it comes to building new second layers and you know, like new tech is what are we, how are we creating value for the end user, right? What are we doing that creates value to the end user in a way that aligns with the mission of Bitcoin and keeping Bitcoin sound, decentralized, the useful store of value in a medium of exchange. That's my vision for Bitcoin. There is no single you know, Bitcoin CEO. So everyone has a slightly different view. My view is everything, every change we make to Bitcoin should be focused on making Bitcoin more secure, more accessible, and more easily used as a store of value in a medium of exchange in a censorship, self-sovereign way. And so what I am a little bit concerned about with a lot of the current layer two conversations is that they aren't working backwards from that goal. Like, how do we serve the user better? They're, a lot of these conversations are like, how can we do crazy new things with a layer two like DeFi? And um, like, but why, right? Like, what are, we, what are we solving? What value are we trying to provide to users? And, and does that align with the values of, of Bitcoin? And, and I would argue a lot of that stuff doesn't, right? But it's permissionless. And some people say, no, we want to bring the casino to Bitcoin because that would be good for Bitcoin too. And I, you know, I get it, um, but it doesn't excite me either. So Lightning is nice because it's very focused on making Bitcoin better as a transactional currency. Um, and so I like that. Um, Fediment is interesting. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're not seeing a lot of user, like really quickly growing user traction here. Um, and I think the core of that is that the, is that there's really two things that have uh, massive product market fit when it comes to layer twos and De and 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 all this stuff, gambling, so like the DeFi world, which we see with Solana and meme coins and all this stuff, or dollars, which people call stable coins. I just call them dollars because that's what they are, um, and uh, and that's where I think there's an interesting sort of path is bringing dollars to lightning. Uh, I think that's going to be pretty interesting for people. Um, so I'm pretty interested about the developments around taproot assets and stuff like that. Uh, what, what, what dollars to the lightning? Or how does, uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, taproot assets is a um, project that lightning labs is working on that allows stable coins like tether to be transferable over the lightning network, mm -hmm. which I think is uh would, 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 would probably be way more popular than transferring Bitcoin over Lightning, to be honest. Yeah, it's, 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 it's basically the use case that you want to send your dollars outside of the bit, outside of the banking system. So that's the, basically the, the Lightning dollars. You can send dollars outside of the banking system, but it's still dollars. So it's kind of, kind of inside the bank. One of the things that I think about the, the medium of exchange side of things in, in Bitcoin and the transactional side of Bitcoin is like, we are, we are just really early on. Bitcoiners don't want to spend their Bitcoin. <laughs> they they want to keep their Bitcoin and they want to just hold them and maybe spend them on a Bitcoin meetup or like when they have some sats on a lightning wallet or something like that. So a lot of the development is still to come because as you say, a product market fit when there's uh, not a lot of Bitcoiners even wanting to spend their Bitcoin, why should why should a lot of companies develop stuff exactly for that? Would be futuristic companies that see five years, ten years ahead, where probably more and more Bitcoiners want to spend their Bitcoin. Uh, and then there's also the tax implications. Most of the time, you have to pay tax when you spend Bitcoin. But that's uh, that's it. Um, which leads me also to my the next question, and we teased it a little bit in the beginning. Uh, we talked about the past of Bitcoin. How do you see, uh, uh, what future trends of adoption uh, do you see, especially with the with the insights that you also have with River? Um, what, what are you currently seeing? So we're very focused on the United States. And so what we see is Bitcoin's continuing its trajectory as being this thing people save in, 
uh, in the United States. The, the situation in the U.S., um, people's baseline is, is dollars, and they've seen their prices go up crazy amounts in dollar terms. Uh, and so, so it makes them question things, uh, and, it, and, it, and it creates a lack of trust in U.S. institutions, and people look for something different. And I think this high-level macro theme is why more and more people and businesses are, are saving in Bitcoin. And so that's the trend we see. It definitely comes in waves. For example, this month is a little bit slower. It's, it's actually a good amount slower than the last two months before. Uh, it has this very cyclical nature. Uh, you, you know, price movement definitely still very heavily impacts new people onboarding. People get just much more excited when the Bitcoin price moves and then when it's somewhat flat and stable. So these are all the general trends that we see. But overall, the the high level trend is is up and to the right in terms of adoption. Mm. What is the most exciting that uh, that you are looking forward in, in in Bitcoin? A lot of people also talk about like, oh, the Bitcoin ETF is not here. Will bring a lot of money in the next like one two whatever years in there. Uh, but what's next? Like we have already nation states kind of. There will be more coming probably. We have publicly traded companies. There will be more coming. Uh, is it? right now just is, is the basis now built and now we're just getting more of all the bases or is there some some i don't know bonds or whatever that you're looking forward to to, to catalyze and, and adoption i don't know how many big sort of more milestones in terms of the first happening but i think there is still so much to happen like there's still so much adoption left from institutions and individuals uh, it has only just begun even for people who have some Bitcoin, right? There's there's still very early in their journey. I think that a lot of people who own Bitcoin today will just continue to get deeper into Bitcoin as a, as a savings tool. Um, they'll keep converting more and more of their wealth and income into Bitcoin. And so, not only is there still a lot of people and companies who haven't bought any Bitcoin, which will change. There are a lot of people who have only dipped their toes in the water and will keep going deeper. So I see that as a, you know, just a major, to me, it's a little more boring, but that's what I see happening over the coming years. It's, 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 it's fine. Yeah. It's a, the, the, the tipping toes is really, really cool. I, I see it a lot when, when friends come in and they're like, oh, how, how do I, I can buy Bitcoin and I'm going to get involved and, and I'm like, yeah, this, and then, like, oh yeah, I bought my first uh, 10 euros of Bitcoin and stuff like that, and then I come back in a few months and they're like, oh yeah, I have like one, two thousand euros now of Bitcoin, <laughs> and and one a friend that I met like a year ago, and now I met him again, and he's like now 80 percent in Bitcoin, and he just started out, and it's, it's, I, I, this is like a current, like this is a, a cycle trend that I see it all over again, like Bitcoin coming in. They, they had the problems when they come in, but then they, they came in, they get educated, they watch some podcasts, they get some news, uh, they research, they get some books, and then all of a sudden it clicks for them and they're like, oh, yeah, this, this Bitcoin thing makes actually sense. And and I'm at this point where I'm like, I would have a hard time sp picking anything else than Bitcoin at this moment. I, 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 don't, I would not know, like maybe a question for you, like, what would you buy now when, when Bitcoin would not be there? Uh, what would I buy if, if I didn't have Bitcoin? Yeah. Um, tech stocks. I would I would just buy the few. Uh, what I, my investment strategy is always buy what do you think the future looks like. So, um, I think the future. I think tech companies will continue to be the ones driving technology in the future forward. So that's that's what I would be buying. <laughs> <laughs> really cool. Um, before we come closer to the end routine, uh, there's this theme where Bitcoiners are really freedom loving in general. Like when, when you come to Bitcoiners, they have different views about different things. They are vegan. They are like uh, people that only eat meat. I forgot the name, a carnivore. Uh, there are different types of people in the Bitcoin community. Like there are a lot of camps, um, but it all kind of comes down to their freedom loving. They want more individual freedom. This is, I, I never uh, met a Bitcoin that is against that. Um, but there are a lot of, uh, outside of the Bitcoin community, there are a lot of forces that 
like want to restrict the individual, want to regulate things, they want to put constraints on the world, uh, on on the freedom that we have. Um, will will Bitcoiners or and Bitcoin uh, force the world or embrace the world to be more freedom freedom loving if Bitcoin adoption also grows? Or as I also can see it, are we just in a really early group? Uh, that is freedom loving and and curious about the world, or or is or is Bitcoin actually changing society f- fundamentally? I I think and I and I like to believe that Bitcoin will continue to change people. I think that when you start going down that rabbit hole, you start to see things somewhat differently. I think a subset of people already saw it that way, and then were gravitated to Bitcoin. I think that was a very early group of people. Um, I think I was like part of that group. I think that, um, and there will always be people like that, but that will always be a niche. That was sort of like the really disagreeable, wacky people that said all the way, the way thing, we're doing things today doesn't make sense. Um, most people won't be that way. But Bitcoin is a really non-threatening way to start taking people down that philosophy of freedom. Now, on the other side of the coin, what also matters is how strong the opposing forces become, uh, and you know how how much how effective are they at controlling uh, society and preventing people from seeing the, seeing the light. And it's hard to say. Uh, it's hard to say, but I think we're winning. Um, I think we're winning, but we have a long ways to go. And Bitcoin doesn't fix everything magically, right? There is a lot of sort of waking up that people have to do outside of Bitcoin, but um, we'll see. Yeah, it's, 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 I'm often asking myself, like, where are we in the Bitcoin phase? And also, like, as you said, Bitcoin doesn't fix everything. It's, I always bring up that sand example. If, if Fiat standard is like running on sand, running on mud, uh, you can kind of run, you can kind of do your things, uh, but it's hard because sand is dragging you down. It's, it's like the steps are hard. And like Bitcoin is this like running on a solid street. It's way easier for you to just run on a solid street, uh, but you still have to run. Like if, if you don't do anything on a proof of work Bitcoin standard, you you will get nowhere anyways. Uh, but the, the the question that I thought of uh, uh, is in my mind: Are we in the then did join us stage? When you think of like this, this four steps: like they laugh at us, they ignore us. Uh, and then the then they join us, or the then they fight us, and then they join us. Uh, are they still are they still fighting us? Kind of with the, like the Bitcoin ETF looks like they are joining us, but then there's Elizabeth Warren and Jamie Dimon or that camp that still fights us. Uh, do, do you have like an explanation like where where are we kind of in this this phases? I I think that optimistically we're towards the end of the they fight us phase very optimistically but we don't know there's been some early signs in the last few weeks at least in the united states um i think a lot of it comes down to sort of what the presidential what happens with the presidential election um i think that uh we'll see in november sort of you know if trump wins i would say that we're at least temporarily out of the they fight us phase um if he loses i don't think that's going to be the case but it's also possible that Trump going pro Bitcoin will cause the Democrats to say, you know what, we're going to ease up on this too, because this isn't winning us any votes. Um, And our donor, and it's also just pissing off our donors. Like we just have nothing to gain from being anti Bitcoin. There's there's no one who's voting for a party because they're anti Bitcoin. Um, It only hurts you to be anti Bitcoin. So if that's what we're seeing happening, which there's signs that we are, then then that's promising. Um, But we'll see. I don't know for sure. Mm, I'm kind of envy of the USA. Because in your, in the European Union, we also have elections on the 9th of June, I think. Uh, there is no sayings of Bitcoin <laughs> like this. Like it's not even close to being a topic. And uh, nobody discusses it. Uh, n- uh, not on the European level, not on the Austrian level. There's no sign of any any Bitcoin or crypto or, oh, let's let's figure out what's the actual problem of, of uh, the inflation is. When, when it comes to the inflation topic, yeah, there's Ukraine war. Yeah, that's not the reason why we have inflation. But yeah, it's, it's, it's funny to see. So I'm, I'm really envy of the USA that they at least talk about it. They at least there's talking about it. 
yeah, it's promising. That's yeah, promising, definitely. Um, before we come to the end routine, uh, is there any uh, achievement in, in, in Bitcoin community that, that you made that you are especially proud of? Or like, what's the achievement uh, in your Bitcoin uh, career that you are most proud of? I think other than starting River, which I think it takes the cake for what I'm most proud of and what I'm still focused on, I think it was running the San Francisco Bitcoin developer meetups that brought a lot of very smart people together and created a, um, a forum for people to learn about Bitcoin at a technical level and, um, and for some of the best minds in Bitcoin to just come into the room together and share their insights with others and create new ideas. And so that was many years ago. Uh, but I still, you know, people still tell me how much they enjoyed those and it just always makes me feel really good to hear. So. Uh, I think it was uh, running San Francisco Bitcoin developer meetup. I love that a lot. Um, and what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? Like I'm always interested in Bitcoiners' lives because they are really deeply uh, thinkers. They are uh, usually in in a lot of uh, ways really learning deeply about stuff or doing interesting activities. So, like, what is what are you currently really passionate about besides Bitcoin? So, uh, I love boxing. So I, you know, I really love boxing and, uh, just training and, uh, I don't know why I just gravitate towards it. It's just a sport I love. Um, um, and I also just love history and just keep going down historical rabbit holes and learning about humanity. I just, I can, and I, I think just like learning about humans, um, while technology is important, I do think understanding the world is more important than understanding technology. Uh, and understanding where we're going as a civilization, where my country is going as a society. So philosophy, history, um, and just all of the explanations for why things are the way they are and how to use those tools to predict what's coming. So um, I really I really like that kind of stuff. Do, do you like the uh, direction that we are going? I don't know. I don't really think about it necessarily of like, do I like it or not? Um I think it's very complicated and it's more like I try to focus on like what matters, um, you know, what figuring out what matters, what is the right lever for me to try to pull in my own life. And as a business, um, uh, I think that there's a lot of promising signs. I think there's a lot of challenges. I'm an eternal optimist because I think it's just irrational to not be optimistic. It just leads to a miserable life. So I'm always optimistic. But I try to figure out what can I do to make sure that the expected outcome for civilization is is higher, <laughs> and for my own life and my own family. And and the time is so exciting. Like we we just kind of started the internet revolution. Now it's the, the Bitcoin and some money revolution is 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 on the way. Uh, and then there's AI now coming. This which leads me actually to to my end routine. We have an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question. Uh, for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. Uh, and the previous guest asked a question for you, which uh, follows, do you think that AI will create create less working opportunities for people or more and why? I don't know exactly how AI ends up, but my guess is over the next 20 years, it creates opportunities. Um, I think it deletes a lot of white collar middle management sort of work. I think organizations get leaner and more efficient. But I think overall, that makes society more productive and leads to new opportunities that w are hard to predict. So overall, I would say it'll lead to more productive society and probably a better quality of life for everybody. Um, there will be some pain in certain careers, but I think that everyone will adjust. Thank you. Um, where can, like when, before I let you go, where can people find you in the best way? Where can people like, reach out to you uh, and have ask, uh, questions about you or River? So River is easy to find. We're river.com and we're at River on Twitter. I'm at Leishman, my last name on Twitter. So feel free to follow me there. Perfect. Then uh, thank you, Alex, for, for being on. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, and for everybody watching, uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.